new strategy. Um, I thought, how can I best support this with, with um, coming from my neck of the woods? And what we know for systems thinking is mindset is one of the strongest leverage points to achieve change. Now, before we get into that, I just have to put out a few disclaimers in that this presentation is my personal views. Um, it's not that of ABES because it is based on my, a lot of it is based on my PhD research. And my field work is getting a little old. Um, it, I did, when I spoke to growers um, and others in the system, it went back to 2013 to 2015. And since 2018, I haven't had much involvement in the fruit fly scene. So just be mindful of that. Now, just a bit of background um, about my research. Um, I had it had two phases. First, I looked at um, how do we max maximize success at the local level, and to do that, I looked at three um, case studies in quite some depth. I looked at Central Burnett, which as most of you probably would know is a bit of a poster child. Worked area wide management worked really well in that area. Also looked at Riverina, which at the time um, just had lost a lot of support from um, New South Wales DBI and had to become a lot more industry driven. And Young Harden, who just faced a loss of Thailand, who was looking to establish um, area wide management. So all up, I did 43 interviews, three focus group and a grower survey, and I draw on socio-ecological systems um, literature. In the second phase, I looked at that higher level. How do we create an enabling environment? So to do that, I interviewed people throughout the system from Commonwealth, state and territories, um, industry bodies at different levels to get their views about what works and what doesn't work. And I combined that with innovation systems thinking. Now, today, I will, in my thinking, I'll also be draw of stuff of the things I've done recent, more recently in ABES, and particularly I continued systems thinking, um, but applying it more to general surveillance. We're also doing work around agri-food innovation and grand challenges, social networks. Um, so that also informs my thinking today. Now, fruit fly, um, well, as we all know, new technologies can bring remarkable progress. And it's therefore no wonder that um, most of our scientific focus is on um, technology oriented approaches. But um, if you look at the innovations literature, you'll find that innovation is basically really has four broad components. There's the actors and the relationships, there's the infrastructure, the institutions, which are the rules of the game and the biophysical. With our scientific focus is mostly around the biophysical and the infrastructure, and this is called technocratic thinking. The way technocratic thinking works is that it tends to break down problems into its smallest part to better understand it, to simplify it um, and, and find ways to intervene. This is often called reductionist thinking, and this has been really helpful in the past and continue to be so. But we know when we deal with complexity, it's clear that we need to have um, the bigger picture view as well to consider all the components as well as the interactions between them. Now, if we, if we look at those other two components in terms of the actors, um, if we just look at the local level, we know that fruit fly aeroid management is really complex. It is a collective action issue. People need to work together. They need to trust each other. There's also a whole range of players at the local level, each with their own motivations, barriers, agendas that need to come together to make this work. And then there's the biophysical factors too that add to the complexity such as climate, geography and hosts. But that's not the only actors. We know that, that air or fruit fly sits across from the regional, state, national and international levels with a whole range of players involved. Um, and what we see is that because in, in the biosecurity space, because it often hangs off the international space around WTO and the IPPC, at that level, there's also a lot of technocratic thinking, again, for good reasons. Um, the need to have harmonization, level playing fields to be objective, to be able to compare apples with apples. And that permeates through our thinking right through um, biosecurity, right to the on-ground on level. But it's important to understand that actually in the field, fruit fly management is like no, is similar to other NRM issues. And if you look at the NRM literature, you'll find 
that um, you need to address complex issues with holistic thinking. The other important um, thing to consider is that all these players in the system hold valuable information, not just the higher levels, also at the on-ground level, even just if people knew what will work for them and what won't. Important to know that no one has in-depth understanding of the entire system, and therefore we need to in integrate knowledge from across the system. And even though we have a big, such a big system, um, at the end of the day, if solutions don't work for fruit fly affected growers, really we can go home, isn't it? Um, and what we see um, in social network analysis that um, our biosecurity networks tend to be very dense at the top, which is a good thing. It's good that we're so connected um, and come together. But often those connections aren't very strong down to the on-ground level, which is problematic. Um, hang on. Just so let's have a little quick look at the institutions. Institutions, as I said, are the rules of the game. So obviously there are a fair bit of rules already out there around fruit fly and area-wide management from the higher le level ISBMs, um, the, the um, WTO's um, sanitary and phytosanitary agreement, the strategies at national level, at state levels. Um, and then there's also just the rules around how those local area-wide management programs work. There's also a whole range of broader rules from the netty grid to, you know, where you can put signs against the, the road or what colour those signs can or can't be, right through to aviation rules, what you can do with drones and so forth. That all comes into play when we think of area-wide management. And then there, there are informal rules, the things that tend to happen in our heads, expectations, values, motivations, barriers, peer pressure, also mindsets or path dependencies that flow from that. So my, my point today is we really need to apply holistic thinking. Um, and to, to do that, I'd like to highlight five limitations around technocratic thinking. The first limitation is that, um, sorry, have I stopped sharing? No, I haven't. So I was just getting something out of the way. Um, just a moment. Here we go. Um, sorry about that. The first limitation is that technocratic thinking easily leads to what we call linear thinking and related approaches. Linear thinking goes something like this. We have a technical problem. We find some scientists to find a solution. Then we transfer that solution, that solution to the end users. Nice, predictable, straight line. But when we look at the on ground and where success happens, it often looks a lot more messier. And when we look at our success stories, in particular, Central Burnett is a good example, but also other um, biosecurity case studies and, B and NRM case studies that I'm familiar with, it looks a lot more like this. There tends to be a holistic problem definition, often co-design, and different people with holding different kinds of knowledge coming together um, that identify um, both the problem and the solution. Solutions are tested and solutions are then locally adjusted to be fit for purpose. Now, what is important to understand that is that the dominant sort of thinking kind of permeates throughout the whole, how we organize the system, how we organize funding applications. I can tell you as a social scientist, it's really difficult to get funding if you can't clearly specify all your milestones from the day dot, which is hard when you do this more sort of adaptive processes. Also how we program, um, how progress is measured and other things. The second limitation of technocratic thinking suggests that information provision is the only support that regions need. But what I could see from the case study clearly was that local industries need help to help themselves. There's a lot of knowledge and capabilities that can easily be assumed. So I worked with a bunch of stakeholders to come up with what is the knowledge and capabilities that is needed at the on ground level, other than, you know, bait spraying and all the technologies you would apply. And these include things such as program administration and management, which is significant skill sets, also stakeholder engagement, not just reaching out, but also tougher things like conflict resolution. Of course, there's the understanding QFLY and the on-ground control. And there's a whole raft of things around market access requirements. Some things is pretty straightforward to communicate, but other things are quite difficult, especially when you get into sort of the politics of things. And people also emphasize the importance uh, for growers um, and groups to understand how to consistently implement market access requirements. Um, what was also clear from the case studies that the, their needs differed um, depending on the region and what's already there. 
and evidence showed that there was a need um, for knowledge to be integrating integrated for continued learning, knowledge brokering, um, collaboration and institutional support. Um, so the, the sort of conclusions at the time that I came to was, you know, how can we broaden support at the on ground level, given that um, we know we're not going to go back to the olden days where we had lots of extension offices. So, you know, in the, the overall thinking when, when government pulls out is for the public sector to step in. So I suppose you could say with the extension offices pulled out, the private ag agronomists um, could step in, but very few agronomists know things well about market access, for example, are there ways we could equip them to be more helpful in that space? Or at the time when I was busy, there were some um, consultants trying to break ground in this area. Um, how can we give people at the on ground opportunities to tap into networks and particularly at that higher level? And something that came up repeatedly is please can people minimize staff turnover because people walk a journey, you get that integration of knowledge happening and then they disappear. The third limitation is, um, is that technocratic thinking shapes how success is interpreted and communicated. This really struck me for Central Burnett. So as I said, this program um, has been around since 2003, really successful. But when people told the story about Central Burnett to other areas that go, oh, they're so successful, they do bite spraying, they have mat, and they've got the community on board. If you tell people in, in Riverina at the time, the community is on board, they hear people picking up fruit, bagging fruit, um, pruning trees, netting, baiting. But what happened in Central Burnett, um, there was a lot of social things going on. For one, the town community, all that was asked of them was to sign a piece of paper so someone else could come do the treatment in their backyard. There were... They were actually, without them knowing it, a textbook example of where collective action works well. It's a homogenous industry. Um, they all, most of those growers are export focused. They had to, um, small towns that made it more manageable. And they also had a high employment of free crop consultants, which means there were already existing trust relationships that could be tapped into. But these social institutional aspects easily dropped off in the narrative. And I believe it put unrealistic expectations on other regions to follow um, uh, Sandra Burnett's example. The fourth limitation is that technocratic thinking suggests that there could be a one size fits all. Again, hanging off from the international um, arena, you know, the fact that we can develop protocols and so forth. And there's good reasons for that once again. But it can suggest that, you know, you can develop the perfect error management from the way dot or from the way go. Um, but, you know, as I said, for complex issues, the way to address them is through um, is through learning, through for adaptive management, and particularly in our case, adaptive co-management, which means you need to bring different knowledge systems together, the on-ground knowledge, the market access knowledge, the scientific knowledge, and more. Every region is, is unique. Um, so the conclusion that I, that I came to um, here was that it's really important. I think we can very quick want to jump to, you know, complying with certain protocols, but it's important for regions to first and foremost um, focus on suppression in a way that works for that particular region and then overlay that with the sort of market access requirements. The last limitation I'd like to highlight is that technocratic thinking can limit the institutional opportunities for progress. And for me, this flow particularly from the fact that in most cases, it is a heavy reliance on awareness raising and voluntary approaches. And this is really, really challenging. Um, I know in biosecurity, we talk a lot about, you know, um, uh, um, uh, awareness raising around biosecurity behaviors, but not all biosecurity behaviors are created equal. You probably also have the saying that we should make biosecurity um, practices as, as easy as clicking in a, a safety belt. So let's just think about that behavior. Clicking in a safety belt is quick, it's easy, and it has direct benefit to, to the person doing it. The things we ask, for example, for communities or backyarders, it's onerous and costly to manage backyard fruit trees. We want them to do it indefinitely, and often it involves displaced benefit. Most of that benefit goes to the, to the, um, the industry. 
So I'm um, looking also at some overseas um, examples. Um, I would say we really need to do more work to explore what's called smart regulation options, where you combine forms of regulation with voluntary approaches. Um, we, th we're not strangers to this, you know, levies is a good example. Um, and there's different ways you can do levies. You can also, um, I know in, in, in Canada with OXA, the, with um, Codling Moth, they um, also get funding from people within towns, um, need to have a tax, a land tax that contributes, that helps bring that sustainable resourcing. So, you know, where people can't, can't where voluntary approaches can't be done, you know, it can be, can be done for them. And the other issue, of course, revolves around power. There's very little power at the local level, not even local governments often can enter backyards. Um, are there ways to bring, um, to, to lower the, um, to bring, uh, devolve power, so to speak. Um, so to conclude, I'd really like to encourage you all to um, consider applying more system-based research and approaches um, in the future, to have that bird's eye view, that holistic understanding of the, the fruit fly system and where area-wide management fits in, and how the different parts in the system influence each other. Like I said in my work, I use agriculture innovation systems thinking, it puts a lot of emphasis on things around information integrations, the things I've mentioned around knowledge brokers, collaborative innovation platforms. Um, but since I've also been exposed to other forms of systems thinking, um, such as the book I've got up here, um, Thinking in Systems by Nella Donella Meadows, I highly recommend that book. And it brings other useful concepts such as most limiting factor, leverage points, feedback loops that can um, be intervention points. So my last slide is, please keep exploring better technologies. It is really important, but be mindful that area-wide management, they are complex systems. They require tailored local approaches and adaptive management. People at the on-ground require a wide range of capabilities to integrate and manage this program, not just technical information. It involves the alignment of social, biophysical, institutional, and technological factors and voluntary approaches are very challenging and we need to explore more smart regulation opportunities. Thank you. Thanks, Helene. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, might open it to, uh, to questions there. I'm sure you'll have uh, quite a lot. Uh, I know um, I've got one or two sitting there. Just, uh, just uh, I'm quite eager to ask as well, but I'll open it to the floor first up. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, looks like Stuart's got a question there. Stuart, would you like to ask your question? I would like to ask a question. Um, thanks, Elaine. Um, just using your kind of logic and the thinking you've taken there and the, the work over the, the likes of the Burnett, um, one of the areas that we've been thinking about from fruit fly um, council context and moving forward is the whole thought process of an area-wide management readiness um, thinking process. So in other words, how do you transfer the likes of um, Burnett and the likes of the ones in, in Victoria um, into other regions? What is that going to look like? How do you analyse those? Use the likes of your thinking to go about that process. Um, so just yeah, your thoughts on that. Well, export readiness is a one that's already out there and done in that trade context. Um, but yeah, be interested in the area-wide management thought process. Mm. Yeah, look, I think um, it's very, like I've mentioned before, it is really important to look at the local context, first and foremost, um, and not to see the success stories such as Central Burnett as a cookie cutter. Um, we can definitely learn from them. Um, so certainly at the, at the local level, First and foremost is those trust relationships and um, uh, finding those champions, but also very important because this is what happened in Young Harden back then. Um, it might be different now. They they did that. They they threw a lot of nagging. They got the local council on board. Um, but they struggled at the time to, to connect with the higher levels, to get that guidance in terms of how do we move forward. Um, 
And I think the challenge for us is how do we establish that? Knowing that, you know, we just have so much stuff in, in government departments, we just have so much time. How do we bring that stronger connection and that flow of information? I think in my mind, that is one of the biggest challenge we had. And I, I know in Victoria they've had um, or still have a regional coordinator. So I'd be very keen, keen to, you know, hear their lessons learned as well. Um, but I think for um, for um, for new regions starting, um, it is around the local trust and finding that connection with with higher levels, with both the science and the market access. If that makes sense, does that uh -huh. answer your question? I think Stu's all right with that one. No, 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 it definitely does. Sorry, the, the old mute button took a bit. Yeah, well and truly, thank you. I, would, I, I, I am interested in Bron and the, the rest I see Bron's on there as well. So as I think we had a question there from Bronwyn and then uh, and then from uh, Reeks as well. So Bronwyn, would you like to ask your question first? I think you're on mute. Thanks, Helene. It's a fantastic acknowledgement of the complexities that we face every day. It's market access, but it's also finding all the different things that all those individuals in our community need to trigger some action. And sometimes doing it for somebody else isn't the trigger. Mm. So my question for you is if you see any power or strength in combining our area-wide management strategy to other pests that are also in our region, rather than trying to achieve area-wide management just with the fruit fly hat on. Do you see any opportunities there for us? Oh, I think that that is, uh, I would definitely explore that. Um, I mean, surely we can't have, you know, a whole range of different programs around different pests. And I see that's also what's happening in Canada. I think it started off with codling moth around the OXA program, if anyone's familiar with that, but I see they have added more pests since. Um, and yeah, I think it certainly would. Um, again, it needs to be noted, locally explored in terms of, you know, what, what are those pests? Um, what are the drivers of the different pests? You know, different pests cause different hassle for different industries. Um, so again, it needs to be locally explored, but I would certainly investigate that as a pathway, yes. Right, okay, Reeks, if you'd like to ask your question now. Yep, thanks, Aline, love the presentation. Um, I've just over the last few months had the opportunity, oh, so first the um, uh, crop consultants is one of the sort of the, the players that you identified. I think we we talk a lot about crop consultants and potential role in area-wide management. Um, and over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of growers and crop consultants, not about fruit fly, but another pest, and was really struck again by how, how much their business model, I guess it's institutional constraint, is about selling chemical. Mm. Um, they say the yes. right things about, oh, yeah, we just provide advice. But when you talk to the growers, they go, oh, yeah, they just sell chemical and we pick their brains and then we make mm. our own decisions. Um, do you have a view on how what sort of role they could play in area-wide management. In some respects, they have a lot of great knowledge and they're talking to a lot of growers. And is there like an institutional way to, to, to get more value from them in a way that obviously makes business sense for them as well? Yeah, no, that is, that is a very good question. Um, and I look, and I think that's why you need, you know, various people around the table. If you're going to rely on crop consultants for, who work for a chemical company only, well, that's probably what you're going to get. I think Central Burnett, too, my understanding is that they were private crop consultants, so they didn't have that push to sell chemicals. So that, again, was very helpful in that context. But I wouldn't disregard them. I would certainly um, bring them to the table, but not just rely on them. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good example of, of you know, like I said, if you contrast them with the old extension offices, how the one isn't just a replacement for the other one. And um, yeah, other ways to explore in terms of broadening, whether it's them or someone else, to bring in more perspectives such as the market, ac market access aspects as well. Yeah, thanks. I should just say I have met some that 
that are really focused on providing advice rather chemicals, but they've had a lot of trouble monetizing that because growers aren't willing to pay for it. But yeah, thanks. All right. Well, thanks, Elaine. That was a great presentation and some uh, so obviously some uh, um, interesting questions that were the, that uh, that came out of that. So we might um, Ron, we, we might um, we might move on if that's all right. Um, so. Hazel, if you'd like to uh, start your presentation, that'd be great. And Bronwyn, just don't um, pop your question in the uh, in the chat, and maybe Elaine could uh, answer that on the chat for us. That'd be great. Okay, that looks great. Hazel, ready when you are. Hey, thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation to be part of this webinar. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about digital area wide management um, and start a bit like Elaine with um, insights from work that was done a few years ago now um, when I was personally working much more closely in the fruit fly space um, around area wide management approaches, um, including particularly spatial simulation modeling and scenarios. Um, and then update that with more, much more recent thinking around, I guess, what I see as some of the opportunities there might be now um, for future decision support systems um, that can assist with area-wide management and digital approaches. Um, so why area-wide management? Um, I think there's certainly a number of drivers for this, and I know across systems, not just um, in the fruit fly space, we are facing an increasingly chemically limited future and Sarah has done quite a bit of thinking around this, which you can read here, and what that might mean in terms of how we must think about changing our way of managing pests. Um, and one of those things could be that we need to actually rethink and redesign our approach to pest management and not simply find the next replacement for chemicals. Um, and area-wide integrated pest management approaches um, are one way we might do that. So they're a co cooperative, agroecological and landscape level approach. Um, and this website is um, essentially what emerged from um, uh, one of our major outputs from the project that um, ended back in 2018 um, that we did for Hort Innovation and Rural R&D for Profit. Uh, and this really brought together all the research that we did um, throughout that project and tried to communicate that I guess in a digital format. So this is what we meant, I guess, by digital area-wide management back then. Um, here we defined it as a united, a united strategy targeting all pest habitats within a defined area to reduce the total pest population and requiring engagement from the whole community, coordinators, growers, backyard gardeners. And you could view this website um, in multiple ways, either as a coordinator, a grower, a backyard gardener, and information was given to you accordingly. Um, and these were essentially the eight steps um, that we advocated and we had a lot of detail about behind those and, and the science that informed them. So you can read more about that there. Um, and I think some of the other um, things that emerged from that project were sort of very much aligned, I think, with um, what Helene's saying is how we must need to consider the strategic considerations around what we're actually trying to achieve with area-wide management and the context that that management's taking place in and how that will really then modify essentially what, what might work or what won't work or how you might approach it and so on. Um, so for example, taking a target area or a particular objective, then to think about the socioeconomic context and the landscape context of that management, um, which will have a big impact um, on what may or may not work. Um, the landscape context in particular will influence the pest biology and ecology. Um, and those things together can inform the management tactics of how much, where, how often, all of that sort of thing um, in relation to whatever existing management you have going on. And it's very important then to think back to, how, well, is that achieving the targets that we were hoping to meet and the objectives? Um, and depending what your management practice is, might be influenced by certain regulations, um, certain guidelines, um, and also have its own impacts of context, such as socioeconomic and landscape context, where you may or may not be able to apply, for example, pesticide. Um, and as you move to novel approaches like sterile insect technique, there's other considerations as well, and, and they generally tend to be a little more complicated to um, consider how they can be um, beneficial um, in what socioeconomic context and so on. And so that was a big part of the research that we did. Um, 
And I'm just going to focus on one aspect of the work that we did, which was, um, I suppose, some of the more digital research that we did that we didn't necessarily communicate in a digital format at the time. Um, but it, it's a spatial simulation modelling approach that can help us really understand um, how landscape con context influences management tactics that you might use in a particular, under different scenarios um, of the pest biology and the ecology. Um, so this work was um, largely done by Florian Schwarzmuller, who's now back in Germany. He was a postdoc with us at the time, um, and he developed a spatial, sim spatial explicit population dynamic model, which um, focused on the ecology and behaviour of Queensland fruit fly um, and took into account particularly the hosts and how they change in, over time, the seasonality, their quality and their distribution in the landscape. And it was really understanding how the landscape complexity can influence um, whether or not a area-wide management approach or management on farm is likely to be successful in a particular context. Um, so the landscapes um, were developed in such a way that um, we could generalise um, existing landscapes to a model. Um, so these were, um, this is just an example of one such landscape where we'd have a single commodity per hectare um, which comprises then patches in the landscape of different commodities and they vary by quality and season. Um, we focused um, in, in the southern region um, at the time that was um, very topical and an important driver of the research that we were doing to understand um, how we can use these sort of approaches to reduce pest populations and potentially achieve area freedom in those areas um, also with the sterile insect facility nearby. Um, and we took landscapes in those regions and then generalised them in this way um, so that they would be representative of all, all the different kinds of landscapes that we might find. Um, and then we looked at what the populations might be in those landscapes, um, which was taking quite a simple stage structured approach, which didn't take into account temperatures, um, but focused more on how host quality affects reproduction development and survival in those landscapes and how the pests would move around in those landscapes over time. Um, we explore various mechanisms of dispersal and found when compared with data that directed movement and triggered movements were the most realistic. Um, and you can read more about how that model works and um, what it does in this paper here that we published a few years ago. Um, but moving more to the management results that we looked at with that. Um, so we looked at best management practice essentially, um, which is various forms of management applied to the, the fruit fly, um, which Im impacts on different stages of their life cycle, whether it's the adult stages um, through protein based lures and kills or male annihilation, um, which affects the reproduction successes, and then um, the orchard sanitation, which would then essentially remove um, larvae from the system. Um, and then how we assess that um, in terms, well, it's in two ways, I suppose, in terms of the area that is affected by the pest and that how that would be reduced or how we would expect that to be reduced under a particular management scenario um, and how that might um, influence the population over time so that it may be reduced um, under a particular density, um, which may be some sort of threshold um, at which it can be observed. Um, so looking at best management practice, management practice with 60% of um, the area undertaking best management practice, um, looking at it in different seasons um, and comparing a managed and unmanaged scenarios. Um, so this particular scenario is sort of very mixed sort of landscape um, and then looking at then what that would mean in terms of management. Uh, and then we compared different contexts. So this for example here is rural citrus and grapes. So the citrus is yellow and the bright green is the grapes um, and other um, less or non-attractive host crops in the landscape and what that then means for the success and the management outcomes. So just looking at the temporal um, success, as it were, um, whether it's unmanaged and managed, there's definitely an impact that that management has in that landscape. Um, this is again the best management practice 60% scenario. Um, but when you have grapes in an urban setting, so that's all the bright green and the grey is the urban, um, we see that that kind of management really has less impact. So you could say that it's perhaps a lot more effective in that first context, context rather than the second. 
Um, but in the urban context, there's perhaps other things that could be done, other approaches. Um, and then we're able to explore, well, how successful we would expect they might be. So, for example, if we track all year in an urban context, we could achieve a lot of success potentially um, in terms of pest suppression. Um, however, that might not be feasible. So then we might explore, oh, well, what if we just trap for some period? Um, and in this case, we found that trapping in um, the third quarter, so essentially spring, um, would achieve, if that's the only time that you could um, do trapping or if you could only do it in one season, then that would be the, the most successful in that context. So from that, we could put forward some general recommendations and guidelines around different landscape contexts um, and what we, we expect the chance of success might be given your landscape context and the kind of approach that you might use. Um, and so I guess in conclusion from that modelling study was that the design and implementation and the evaluation of these programs needs to take into account both the existing management practices and that landscape context, um, also the level of engagement. So if we don't achieve that 60%, we're less likely to have that success um, and the complexity of the landscape. Um, so this is something that we're still working on publishing is pretty much there, um, but hopefully we'll publish that shortly. Um, then I, I wanted to move on, I guess, to where um, personally my thinking and um, some of my colleagues is at now across um, Ag and Food and also in Data61 in terms of how we might move um, area-wide management forward, building on these sort of ideas, um, simulation-based approaches um, and scenarios. Um, and so I'd like to introduce you to you this concept of digital twins um, and a digital twin for multi-actor landscape management. So what is a digital twin? So I guess what I was just talking about was um, where you have some sort of data from physical space um, that's interpreted in a model and we get some sort of results, we interpret them as academics and we give some conclusions. A digital twin, I think the key thing in relation to models um, is that it's a much tighter coupling between that physical space, that data collection, the model interpretation and putting that information back out there as decision making. Um, and um, this concept comes from manufacturing, from, in fact, from spaceship design. NASA have used it to launch shuttles um, where they basically create a digital replica of a physical system. And they're able to then look at what if this fails, what if that fails, how do I intervene, um, how to, um, and look through different scenarios. Um, and so we're now really starting to think about how we can translate this to physical space um, and manage physical systems. And um, the idea is that this sort of thinking can enable more dynamic, coordinated, real-time system management and actions. Um, so we've currently got a new postdoc in the team who's, who's um, doing a lot of thinking in this space. And in terms of sustainable pest management practices, or indeed any sustainable management practices um, at the landscape scale in agriculture, I think there's some real novel science challenges. Um, in relation to this concept. So how we assimilate data from a wide range of sources um, with the ability for models to actually handle the uncertainty in that data and the parameters or any missing processes. And certainly in the ecological space, that's a real challenge. Um, and you need a system that's capable of solving large complex optimization problems. Um, as Helene made very clear, we need to incorporate human as well as biophysical systems and include multiple actors who may even have competing objectives in that system. And I think very key to this is that information access and intervention um, is, is made much more freely available and dynamic, um, allowing intervention by users, allowing information extraction from um, a, a digital system and users to be able to try out scenarios and look at the tra trajectory of a system across time. And very importantly, the use of this digital twin would not be then constrained to experts or modelers such as myself, um, but could actually be used by a number of decision makers at different scales. Um, and this is happening already, at, certainly at the farm scale. We're seeing um, a, num a lot of research emerging around um, the use of farm management systems um, and how those essentially comprise a digital twin in terms of we acquired data from a field from a whole range of digital sources. Um, we have a virtual field um, which can then be interpreted through this farm management system to help farmers make decisions. 
Um, one example um, that we have at CSIRO is what we call Agronomy, which is a partnership with Microsoft. And it's basically bringing together a whole heap of disparate data to help farmers see a fuller picture of what's going on on their property. Um, the sort of information that you might get at that scale um, is here, like when you're ready to be harvested, um, what is the amount of fertilizer required in a field. But I'd say that in, even at this scale, there's still a, a big gap for pest management. Um, but you can see that quite easily you might translate this to show me your current pest populations and store it in history of the field. And um, what is the average pest damage for strawberries over the last four years? Or what is the amount of pesticide required for the subplot in which I'm currently located? And those things could start to be built into farm management systems. And indeed, I think some companies are already considering that. Um, but in terms of area-wide management, I think it's really how we then layer up um, our understanding of physical data and models um, with biophysical data and models, such as that I showed around the fruit fly, um, and then the socioeconomic data and models on top of that, and how information might flow between those. Um, and at the moment, the sort of approaches that we're using are agent-based modeling and machine learning to help us um, build this system. But what we are realizing is certainly there's increased complexity and reliance on modeling as you move away from the landscape up into the ecology and the, the socioeconomic data as well. Um, there are some examples of that larger scale digital twin already at CSIRO in other spaces. So there's the New South Wales digital twin, which is really um, about urban environmental data sharing, which can help decision making in that urban space. Um, and there's something called Spark, which is basically bushfire prediction and analysis. Um, so understanding how bushfires may move across the landscape and how you might better manage that. Um, at an even bigger scale, um, the European Union um, has a flagship initiative, um, which is called Destiny, which is all about building digital twins at a massive scale. And a particularly interesting example, I think, is this um, biodiversity digital twin, which is a digital twin prototype to help protect and restore biodiversity. So it's worth checking out the sort of things that are going on at that scale and what people hope to achieve. And underpinning all this really is the, the acceleration of access to big data. Um, so a greater volume of data, a greater velocity, a greater speed at which we can access that data and a greater variety of data, um, which is also becoming available in this space. And it gives us the potential value in terms of intelligence and an interpretation of that data that we can really understand what might be happening in our landscapes much more than we perhaps could before. Um, so for example, in relation to area-wide management of pests um, in, at the physical level, um, we're getting a lot more automated weather and climate data inputs that are very easily um, integrated into a digital system, into models. Um, for example, the Climate Services for Agriculture has APIs that you can easily access and pull out that information on the fly. Um, we've got biophysical automated pest observations. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Rapid Aim um, trap and monitoring system, um, which emerged from our team at CSIRO, um, which is um, led by Nancy Shellhorn. And we've also been exploring recently the, um, the acceleration of publications that are based on image-based um, insect identification systems. So there's lots of different ways that people are exploring to remotely and automatically monitor um, pest populations, essentially. Um, and social systems as well. We're starting to see some data emerging on those too, which I think is quite exciting. Um, this is a company that's based in New Zealand um, and they're collecting um, check-in data essentially for biosecurity purposes, but it really gives an amazing opportunity to obtain networks of connections between properties, which can not only help you see um, where there may be some vulnerabilities for biosecurity, but also where you might intervene to start considering how you might manage um, when there's an outbreak or even before then to reduce um, problems and spire security threats. So I think there's some really interesting potential data there as well. Um, but one of the barriers and challenges that I see is that there are all these amazing plethora of data collection systems, farm management systems, commercial technical companies um, and government which are collecting big data on farm, but the data cannot be accessed currently to inform area-wide management. So it's a huge challenge whether we can access data which may have been collected for one purpose and use it for something else. And there's a lot of privacy and sensitivity concerns as well 
Um, so will it be fantastic to have this data? Will this, this violate some privacy for the grower or some commercial advantage either for the grower or for the tech company themselves? Um, and I, I don't really see right now any mechanisms currently in place, but I'd like to think that we can come up with ways that we can more effectively share data um, because it is very, very important um, to underpin this sort of thinking and area-wide management approaches. Um, but given that, it's just the sort of, um, I guess I see where this is heading, the sort of information you might get out of a digital twin system in area-wide management. Um, and I think it would be for users, um, multiple actors at different scales, um, and in the, both in the short term and in the long term. So for farmers, they may interact with such a system just simply to know where, where are pests right now? Should I be worried? Um, when might I need to spray? Um, but also, would there be any impacts of spraying at this time? Um, whether pest management practice or integrated pest management plan is likely to be more effective than what's currently happening on farm, um, or perhaps dif if different rotations might give less risk um, given a longer term forecast. Um, for the general public, it, it would be good for them to perhaps know if if they should engage in a program, how they should engage in an area-wide management program, um, but also to know that um, management is um, not having any negative impacts, for example, on biodiversity in the longer term. Um, crop protection industries could benefit in terms of knowing where to target, um, whether novel technologies are like to be effective, especially cost-effective, um, and perhaps even in the longer term if resistance is likely to develop and how that could be managed. Um, and policymakers, which is where I see certainly probably the biggest use for this sort of platform, um, would be how we can then coordinate these area-wide management practices. So looking at which locations you might target or maybe at most at risk across a, a landscape and how you might target them um, for the most effect, both um, how you might intervene within the social system as much as within the biophysical system, um, where to undertake surveillance, um, what sort of compliance or what level of compliance is required, um, and how that might actually help us maintain food security or market access, um, which can often come down to when, where and how to intervene. And at all these different levels, as you implement different strategies, of course, there would be significant feedback loops in the system that I'd hope that we could capture through that. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm hoping this is heading. Um, but like I say, I think there are some challenges that we face. Um, but to summarise, I think, as Helene also said, context is really important when considering area-wide management. And I think that models and scenario-based approaches can help identify where and when it's likely to be successful. And they can also help improve our understanding of the behaviour, the population dynamics and the distribution of pests um, and help consider the effectiveness of, of implementing new management approaches. Um, if we can then integrate that with real-time observation data, um, and biophysical and, and social data as well, we, we, I hope that we can provide calibrated context-specific management recommendations relevant to growers and decision makers. And if we can do that, the models and the data in real time and integrate them on the fly, it would be, I think it could really provide quite powerful decision support as a digital twin for any particular region um, for multi-actor area-wide pest management. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you, Hazel. Um, really exciting opportunities coming up in the future. Um, and I love the concept around having the digital twin um, in terms of, you know, sort of having a, a, a tool that you can engage with and, and run those scenarios through and actually see, OK, well, what will happen if? Um, and um, yeah, the opportunities around that I can see are quite, quite, quite amazing. So um, ladies and gents, if we have any questions for Hazel, um, would you like to uh, just uh, jump on and um, ask your questions. It was very interesting to see the uh, the, the work that you've done previously with the area-wide management project that, that you had previously with all innovation and where that's actually building from um, in terms of the opportunities that are sort of coming out of that and you know the, the sort of the concept around having it presented digitally previously and now the opportunities in terms of work and go forward in the future are quite uh, quite exciting. Yeah, I think certainly as a modeler, um, I've become very aware that a lot of in the past, a lot of my work has been 
quite academic and I've run the model, I've developed, done all the scenarios and then come up with some result which might be tied to a particular context or something like that. But I'm, I think the whole idea here is that we're, we're trying to move towards putting that scenario-based approach in the hands of decision makers at, at different scales and to make that information more easily available um, through the sort of digital platforms that I'm trying to describe. Um, I think it's not without challenge, but I think for me, the, the important thing is that we start trying to do that and hopefully that will bring along participation in those platforms. So yes, we might not have all the data we need or the, or the models that we need, but if we create that framework, I'm hopeful that then we can build on that. <laughs> Yeah, well, the opportunities that are there in terms of actually capturing some of that uh, that more, you know, the the volume of data that's now available in terms of different systems, and, and as you said, you know, challenges around sort of how do you integrate all that data together um, and get access to that data. But it's it's amazing how much data is actually available, um, and you know, even things like your rapid name, you know, the incorporation of rapid name in terms of um, feeding into into a system and then combining that with weather data and the like, and you know, who are the actors that are engaged with at that level? Um, there's some fairly significant opportunities to actually gain some powerful um, powerful insights out of that. Mm. All right, um, looks like Stuart's got a question. Stuart, would you like to go ahead? I would. Um, thank you. Look, that's fantastic. Um, thanks, Hazel. Um, one of the, the questions just in, in the context of what you're just talking about there is, what's your um, gut feel <laughs> as to how quick we could overcome some of those data sharing issues and more, more without um, promising an interest rates won't rise <laughs> in the next few months? Um, what's the potential um, scenario that we could be, are we two years down the track, five years down the track, 10 years down the track um, for some of these things in a modelling context for us to be able to start using it, or is it sooner? I think, yeah, some of that data sharing privacy issues, we have already been looking at internally. So I know Rix is online and we had a we had an internal project that was exploring the technicalities, I suppose, of how you can privatise that information um, and to what extent that might or might not be acceptable. And it's it's sort of a... Um, both a spatial problem, so, you know, how you might share information that's spatial as well as temp temporal and the, the numbers. Um, so, and to what extent can you fuzzy it up perhaps, but it's still useful. So we've definitely got science that can inform how you would do it. Um, I think it's then, uh, well, I think perhaps we already need a platform to work towards to like say, right, well, here's a, to show the real value in that sharing because I think for people to share that data, they probably got to see the value in doing that. Um, and so, what what that's going to feed into, and and the the benefit that that would have back to growers, um, because like I say, a lot of this data is not just held by government; it's held now increasingly by private enterprise, and it it may not be necessarily in their interest to share that, but it's how we work with growers and those enterprises to actually make that data available for this sort of application that which could be area-wide management decision tools um, and yeah but I, I do think it's not an insignificant challenge probably the biggest challenge in all of this. <laughs> yeah so a little subsequent question with that where would you think you would start what's the thinking of do you start with the bigger size aspect and drill down to grow a level or do you start from the bottom and work your way up to area-wide management up to the larger level or a combination of the above? I guess what I'm hoping to do is put that that large scale framework in place that we can build on. So we can have what data we can get at the moment and some of that might be models as much as data. Um, so where we can't get data, we can certainly model um, <laughs> and base it on what we know about a pest or we know about a, a social system and how it operates and model that. Um, but then as we get more data and information available, the challenge then is how we integrate that into that and improve that system um, uh, over time. But I think building a, the framework is the first thing and we've definitely got lots of other frameworks that we can now draw on, um, as I was showing um, the other initiatives, both within CSIRO and more broadly, um, there's, there's a lot of activity in this place and it's how we, create frameworks that can allow us to easily integrate models and data on the fly um, very quickly. Um, that's, that is a pretty big challenge no, too, um, but it's certainly something that 
we're working on. Cool, thanks. Or is that too annoying for you? No, you just tell me when. Because I can hear you, Hazel, but I can't hear a feeling. Okay, okay, well, on that note, as uh, just looking at the time, it's two o'clock now, so we might uh, might finish it there. But if there are any questions that you do have that uh, come out later this afternoon, for instance, um, and you'd like to ask Hazel or Helene those questions, by all means, send them through um, to our email address at fruitfly at pha.com.au. And on that note, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Hazel, are you still there? Can you have me, Bunny? Chris, are you there? Yeah. No, he's got his ears off already. Doesn't matter. It's just. Just us. Cool. Just us. Cool. Gosh, that's interesting stuff. Just Both very different. Both very different. But you're going to stop the stop recording. recording. Yep.